Good afternoon, everyone. Can I please invite everyone to stand on your feet in honor of the word of the Lord? Uh, today's uh, reading will be James chapter 1, verses 13 to 18. On the count of three, I, I invite you to read with me. Three, two, one. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he will brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits for of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. You want to be seated? So today, uh, we are on our second sermon on the book of James, which is going to talk about dealing with temptations, which I believe this is a problem that every single Christian faces. Have you ever noticed a tendency in us to praise ourselves when things go well? Like, I love sports, right? So whenever I saw a sports team win a championship, I never heard them say, you know what? We are so blessed to win this championship. I mean, we don't deserve it. It was just pure luck. I think God is on our side. You never heard that, right? What we always heard is they say, we work hard for it. We deserve this victory because it shows how good we are and our commitment. So we tend to pat ourselves on the back when good things happen to us. Can you agree with that? But do you know what we do when things go wrong? Do we blame ourselves? Most of the time we don't, right? So when things go wrong, what we usually do is, what we usually do is we blame everything around us. For example, we say like, you know what, the reason I fail is because my parents mess up. The reason the business still went bad is because my partner did not do his job properly. Or my church did not grow because the ministers have no commitment. So we credit ourselves for success and we blame others for failures. Anyone can relate with that? And that's a problem. Because what we do is we use the same mindset and we bring it to our walk with God. So we pat ourselves in the back when we experience spiritual successes, but then we blame God for our spiritual failures. To which James say, hold on a second. No, 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 no. That's not the way it works. So last week, we began a series on the book of James, and we see already that the book of James is extremely practical, isn't it? So last week, we talked about, you know, when you face trials, this is what you ought to do. And so this, is, this pattern is going to be repeated throughout the book of James because James is just extremely clear. James is abundantly clear. Like, you know, he said, like, don't do this, do this, go there, don't go there. He's just extremely clear. I mean, those of you with top A personality like me, you will love the book of James, right? Because it tells you exactly what you need to do and what you must not do. So last week, we looked at how trials are inevitable in Christian life. Every Christian will face trials. But trials are not random because every trial that we experience actually planned by God. And God has a purpose in bringing trial into our life. And the purpose is to make us grow, mature as a Christian. Okay? That's verses 1 to 12. But suddenly, when we get to verse 13, it seems like James suddenly changed his topic from talking about trials to temptations. But that ain't true. Because we can't say it in English you have to read the Greek Bible for this. But the Greek word that James used for trials and temptation is actually the exact same word. Okay? Say that word together with me in count of three. One, two, three. Perasmos. Now, so this is very interesting. So why would perasmos translated as trial in verse 1 to 12? And in verse 13 to 14, the English translator decided to change it to temptation. Okay. Are they just playing around? Are they just changing the Bible? I don't think so. Because here's what we know about words. The same word can have a couple of different nuances, right? And here's what we know about trials. Trials do not always produce maturity. 
a lot of Christians, when they face trials, rather than growing their faith, you know what happened? They walk away from their faith, right? Instead of growing deeper, they lose faith. And do you know who they blame? God. Okay, they say things like this. Like, the reason I no longer become a Christian, the reason I no longer trust God, because where was God when I needed Him? Where was God when my child was sick? Where was God when my husband left me? He was not there. I'm sure we heard that a lot. And in today's passage, James is correcting this very error. Because James, 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 he's, a, he's such a really good pastor. I mean, I, I wish I can be a pastor like him because he's just very direct. He just really speaks to people's heart. And if I can sum up his argument, if I can sum up my sermon, this is what James is teaching us. God tests us, but he never tempts us. The test may come from God, but the temptation to sin comes from inside of us. In other words, the trial we face may come from God. The circumstances we're in may be planned by God. But if we find that trials lead us to sin, it ain't God who tempt us. Okay? So let's look at it together. I have three points for my sermon as usual. The poison, the spread, and the antidote. Let's look at the poison together in verse 13 to verse 14. This is what James said. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Now, hear me. Hear me very clear. Every trial carries temptation. See, every difficulty we face, every trouble that comes our way is a test that either makes us a better person or worse. So every trial is actually an opportunity for great growth or terrible danger. Every trial will change us. It either pushes us to become a much better, wiser creation or a much worse person than we were before. See, what is impossible is to stay the same after facing a trial. Okay, so last week, last week we looked at how trial is supposed to be a blessing. Remember that? How God uses trial to actually make us to desire God and to want God, to grow in our faith with God. But at the same time, here's another side of trial. Trial also brings temptation. Because a financial trial can tempt us to question God's provision in our life. When we lose someone we love, we are tempted to doubt God's love for us. When we suffer injustice, we are tempted to question, God, where are you? Where is your justice? Do you even exist, God? So trial is only a blessing if we respond rightly to our circumstances. So which means every trial requires decision. We can either persevere and grow, or we can walk away and perish. You with me so far? Let me give you an illustration for my own life, okay? If you do not know, um, I'm a full-time pastor. That means Monday to Friday, Saturday and Sunday, I am pretty much at church. And because I'm a full-time pastor, it comes with a couple of privileges. Like one of them is people see me as a religious authority. So when I talk to people, usually, usually, not all the time, but usually my word carry more weight than other people. And that's a good thing, right? But being a religious authority is also a trial. Okay, think about it. Let's say I have a terrible week. Anyone have a terrible week? Okay, let's say I have a terrible week. If I was just a regular Christian, I could get into a situation where I felt spiritual drive, where I don't read my Bible, where I binge on Netflix Monday to Friday, you know, and I could simply take spiritual vacation for my walk with God, right? So what will happen is, you know what, you know, my heart will become cold, I become joyless, cranky, easily offended, and most likely I will give in to many temptations. But eventually, I will hear Pastor Sam, Edric, or Josh preach the sermon, and I'm like, oh my God, that's for me, and then I repented, okay? And I'm like, okay, fine, God, I'm going to get back in track in my relationship with you. But it's the problem with being a pastor. That doesn't work for me. Why? Because every seven days, I have to get up in front of you and say, hey, guys, God is great. God is awesome. God loves us, and he wants us to obey him out of love. So every seven days, I have to open up my Bible and tell you this is what God wants to say to you. So what am I going to do if I have a terrible week? 
I have two choices. One, I'm going to wrestle with God. Every single morning, I'm going to say, God, my heart is cold towards you. I, 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 I do not find you beautiful today. I, my heart is just f- feel very distant from you. But, you know, God, on Sunday, I have to tell people that you are lovely. On Sunday, I have to tell people that you are awesome. So God, help me, help me, help me, help my heart, melt the coldness in my heart. So that means every day I have to pray to God, come to Him, ask Him, Lord, would you melt the ice over my heart? Because I can't tell people that you're great when I don't feel that you're great. I can't tell people that you're amazing when I don't feel that you're amazing. I can't tell people this is what God says when I don't even know what God says to me. See, in other words, I have to pray myself hot every day. I can't take spiritual vacation. Okay, that's not on the plate for me. And doing that constantly will make me grow as a pastor. Or two, the second thing that I can do, I can just ignore it. Fake it every single Sunday. Right? So I come here and say, guys, God is great. Yeah, whatever. God, this is what God wants you to do. While well, I'm leaving the total opposite. So I have a choice. I either will become a far more genuine pastor than I was before or a far more hypocritical pastor than I was before. But I won't stay the same. And this not only happened to me, it also happened to you. Let me give you a daily life example. Let's say you get promotion at work. What do you do? Let me tell you, that promotion is a trial. Do you ever think that? Because that trial brings Temptation, what do you do with your promotion? Well, you can either make it humble you and say, God, why me? I mean, I have a lot of coworkers, I think, who are more talented than me. They're more hard worker than me. I think they are genuinely more talented than me, but why me? So promotion humbles you. Then you realize that my promotion is actually come from God. And because of that, now you become generous with your money. You realize that now you earn more money. That's not become a reason for you to enrich yourself. Rather than now you can use that extra money to give more for the kingdom of God. Now you not only give 10%, you give 20%, 30%, 40%. Or promotion can make you more arrogant. You say, see, look at me. You know why I'm promoted? Because I, hard, I work harder than everyone else. Because I am more talented. Because I am better, I'm smarter than other people. I deserve this promotion. You feel entitled to it. And it makes you stingy. Why? Because now you believe that you deserve that promotion, and now promotion can tempt you into believing that luxuries are necessities. So now what you deserve is a brand new Ferrari offer a CRV. Okay? So I do car rotation now, as you can see. So promotion is a trial, but it's also a temptation. It will not keep you the same. The same with you getting laid off from work. See, when things go badly, it can make you more humble. It can make you more compassionate and more understanding, or it can make you bitter. You become very self-absorbed and anxious. But here's the thing, it will not leave you where you were. Trial bring temptations. So here's what James is saying. When God tests us, it is to make us grow and bless us. When the opposite happens, the blame does not lie in God. So what we can't say, we can't say this, I became like this, I became this bad because of God. Why? Because James said God cannot be tempted with evil and he tempts no one. And then James continues to say, the reason, listen, the reason that you are tempted to sin, the reason that you fall into sin is because you want to do it. Nobody makes you sin. No trial makes you sin. No people makes you sin. Even the devil cannot make you sin. The reason you sin is because you desire it. You need to get this right. This is very extremely important. Listen, there is a big difference between the occasion and the cause. You you know what I mean by that? There's a big difference between occasion and cause because the occasion is a trial, but the cause of sin is our own desire. Let's say a math teacher gives a test. 
okay? What's the purpose of math teacher giving a test? Well, for the students to know how much they have learned so far, correct? So let's say suddenly the math teacher give a test, and the purpose of the test is for the students to find out, actually, have I learned the material that, you know, that my teacher have taught me so far? But if the students have not been paying attention in class and did not do their homework and failed the test, listen, the test does not cause the student's failure. Do we remember that? The student fail because they did not do their part. The test is the occasion for failure, but not the cause of failure. This is very important. Because like every student, okay, the students who fail could simply say, if only my stupid math teacher did not give me that test, I would not fail. So the students justify themselves and blame the math teacher for their failure. They mistake the occasion for the cause. And James say, uh 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 uh, you can't do that. God is not at fault. God did test you, yes, but if you fail your test, that's not on God, that's on you. It refilled the condition of your heart because God did not make you sin. You sin because you desire to sin. You are responsible for your action. And this is something that is echoed throughout the Bible, okay? No one, no one sin out of necessity. We sin because we want to. For example, anyone get angry this week? Anyone? Anyone explode in anger this week? Okay, some of you are very honest. When you're angry, let, let's say you, you're exploding in anger this week, all right? You can say to me, listen, yours, I really didn't want to get angry but you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what my husband did to me. You don't know what my wife did to me. You don't know what my kids did. I had no choice. I didn't want to explode, but he made me angry. And James would say, uh-uh, I'm sorry. That's not the way it works. You exploded because you wanted to be angry. You wanted to let that person know how much he hurt you rather than showing kindness. That's why you exploded. You always do what you desire the most. Do you know what it means? It means no matter what circumstance, you and I always have a choice. And we always do what we desire the most. And that is why James said no one can escape taking responsibility for their action. See, when we are tempted and we fall into sin, it is because at the depth of our heart, we desire to do it. Sin always starts within us, not the devil, not our boss, not our spouse, not our kids. See, we sin when we are lured away by our own desire. So we may have been put in a very difficult situation. We may have been wronged by other people around us, by the situation around us, but all the situation did was provide opportunity, provide occasion for the evil part of us to come out. So we must realize, though God is sovereign in our trials, we are responsible for our temptations. So if you fall into temptations, the bad news is there's no one to blame but ourselves. The poison is none other than our own evil heart. We are our own worst enemies. But let us look at how the, po the poison spread then. Okay, okay. How, does, how does this desire for anger then make me explode it? Okay, let's look at it. Because James will tell us how this actually spread. Okay, which leads me to my second point, the spread, verse 15. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death, okay? So James here gives us the progression and the spread of sin. And the word desire there, I highlighted, is a very interesting word because we talk about this in our series on Galatian. It is a very, very important Greek word, okay? You guys remember what that word is? You guys remember? Okay. I feel like I'm a failure as a preacher now because no one remember. Okay, the Greek word for that word desire is a very, very important word and that word is epitomia. Remember that word from my sister in Galatians? Okay, what is epitomia? 
Well, ESV translated as just desire on this part. Uh, but some other translation translated as a evil desire. So they said epitomia is ep- evil desire, but it's actually not right. Epitomia is over desire. So the way sin works is not that we want bad things. That's not the way sin works. The way sin works is we want something so badly. We want it so much. Okay, let me just give you my one, okay? My personal example, desire for approval. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I, I like being liked by people. Okay? I, I like it when people like my sermon. Okay? I like it when people say nice things about my sermon. I like it when people say something nice about me. I don't like it when I see some of your face sleeping in the crowd. Okay? So I, I, I enjoy being approved and being liked by people. Is it wrong? I don't think so. Every one of us has desire to want to be approved by other people. And I believe God wired us that way, okay? You know why I believe that? Because remember what happened when Jesus was baptized? Okay? So when Jesus was baptized, remember what something happened? The clouds were open, and then there's a voice from heaven saying what? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So even Jesus himself, before he began his ministry, he needs the approval from God the Father, that God the Father is saying, I'm pleased with you, my son. So there's nothing wrong with desire wanting to be approved. But this is what epitomia does. Epitomia make me crave approval so bad. It make me want approval no matter what. It become approval, become the main thing in my life. So now I begin to chase approval from people around me, and when I don't get it, I'm angry. I become the type of person, or maybe who has no conviction, or I become the type of person who continue to try to prove myself better than other people in order to be accepted. And what James is saying here is, if we desire human approval more than God, if we desire control more than God, if we desire comfort more than God, whatever it is that you desire more than God, that over-desire will lead you to sin. Do you see what happened here? Because the Bible tells us that sin is not about breaking the rules. Get that? Sin is not about breaking the rules. Sin begins when we desire something more than God. Okay, that's why. Look at, look at James put it beautifully. He says this. See, when our over-desire lures us and entices us, what happens next? He says this. Desire, when it has conceived, give birth to sin. Okay, conceive. If you don't know what that word means, conception means something inside that will eventually pop out, right? So we, we might punch someone in the face this week. We might harm them. But it begins with anger inside of us. And then comfort later. And then James continue. And, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And James talking here about spiritual death, which is we're separated from God. And notice the spread. Notice carefully. Death comes from sin. Sin comes from conception. Conception comes from being lured and enticed. Being enticed comes from an over-desire for something more than God. Which means it all begins with desire. Now, Sinclair Ferguson described the progress of temptation in six words. Okay, this is beautiful. It says this, the first one is attraction. It begins with attraction, which means our heart is drawn to something else besides God. Second, deception. Now we feel like I must have that thing to be happy. Third, preoccupation. Now we begin to think about it more and more, and because of that, we desire it more and more. And fourth, conception. We begin to pursue that thing and act upon it. Fifth, subjection we quickly become enslaved and addicted to that thing. And six, desperation. Now, confronted by our failure, we believe there's no way back. I'm hopeless. I might as well give up completely. Let me give you, let me put these six different cycles, progress, using one very devastating sin, the sin of 
adultery. Adultery does not happen overnight. It ain't happen overnight. Okay, let me show you how adultery usually happens using this progress of temptation. Okay? So this is what happened. So you are facing trials in your marriage. So you and your spouse are having this trouble, and because of that, you continuously fight, and it makes you feel empty on the inside. And, and because of that, you feel like, now, I think I deserve better than this. I deserve better than my moronic husband. Okay? So now you want your spouse to adore you, but you don't have it. And you feel like you can't be happy unless you have his or her adoration. But then, here comes someone. And that person gives you the attention that you want. That person keeps saying good things about you, praising the way that you dress, praising your accomplishment, and you're like, ooh, this person actually care about me. This person actually makes me feel like I'm somebody, and you like it. And you begin to think about that person more and more. I mean, of course, right? You know you should learn. I mean, you know you should learn, but you can't help it because you like the attention that that person gave you that you don't get from your spouse. You crave it. So now you begin to entertain that thought and desire and create space in your life for that person. And then an opportunity arises where you can act on your desire. Maybe it's that business trip. Maybe it's that time alone at the office, just the two of you. And let me tell you, this is the real danger zone. This intersection between desire and opportunity where they meet is extremely dangerous because one without the other, you'll be fine. But when the two are together, you are in big trouble. When desire meet opportunity, it is often the location of disaster. I like that. I'm like, pretty good, pretty smart to come up with that. So what do you do? You sleep with that person. And you feel bad. Oh no, what did I do? Oh, this is just going to be a one-time mistake. And you promise yourself, I'm going to be a better spouse. I'm going to be a better parent. But then you continue to return to that person. You are addicted to that person and you can't let it go. And eventually, you just give up completely. You walk away from your family and you choose that person. Now, can you see what happened? That's my point. All sinful action starts as a little embryo in the heart. It grows from embryo to baby to adult. It starts with a desire that then leads to sin and then leads to death. And what I'm trying to say is simply this. Do not wait until sin is grown and strong and rampaging through your life. Fight sin at its earliest point. Do not let sin grow up. Now I know at first, I know at first, it feels harmless. It's just desire. But my friend, let me tell you, sin is a predator that wants to kill you. Like how many times, how many times have we heard a story of in news? A man is attacked by his pet tiger. Right? So what happened was, you know, this man has a pet tiger named Simba. And Simba was really cute, you know, really, really cute. And was small. It was like a cat, but a million times cuter. And the man used to wrestle and play with Simba, and everybody loved Simba. All the neighbors loved Simba. And one day, Simba snapped and bit the man's leg. And everyone always acts so surprised. Oh, I can't believe it. Simba was always so cute. Simba was gentle and sweet. We can't imagine Simba would do that. They always play together. To which we always want to say hello. Simba might be cute. But Simba and Hello Kitty, it's a predator. And it's always in a tiger's nature to attack and eat what's weaker. No one should be surprised when predator elects a predator, right? So let me give you how not to be eaten by tiger 101. Are you ready? This is mind-blowing. This is going to radically change your life. How not to be eaten by tiger 101. Here's what you need to do. Just one thing. Do not have tiger as your pet. It doesn't matter how cute it is because it will eventually eat you. And my friend, that is the exact picture of sin. 
Sin is not a pet for us to play with. Sin is not Simba, a cute Simba. Sin is an enemy that we must drive out before it destroys us. And James is saying there's no better time to fight sin than right now. Right now. Do not overestimate yourself. Don't say, well, it's just a desire. I'm okay with it. I can deal with it later. I can handle it. It's not going to harm me. I can always walk away from it whenever I want to. No, you're fooling yourself, my brothers and sisters. Do not believe the lie of the enemy because the longer you wait, the harder it is. Sin in your life will only grow stronger and stronger. And it's only a matter of time before it destroys your life. So it's a reflection, reflection question for all of us. Is there sin in your life? Is there sin in your life that you've been too friendly to? Do not let it grow up. Do not entertain it. Do not play with it. Do not let sin grow from embryo to adult. Do not let sin grow from desire to conception. Fight it at its earliest point. Okay, you might think that's, that over-desire will not harm you as long as you keep them under control. You might not see any real consequences of it right now. But if you don't deal with them, it's only a matter of time. Only a matter of time before you will be eaten. Because sin, you know this, sin never stops where you want it to. Never. It keeps taking you further and further and further. And before you know it, you find yourself doing things that you thought you never would have done it before. But do you know where it all begins? It doesn't happen overnight. It begins here. Desire. Every sin is an inside job. So the question is, then how do we deal with temptation? And how do we fight this temptation to sin? Which led me to my third point. The antidote. Verse 16 to 18. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow, shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruit of his creatures. Now, so when I first read this, I feel like, uh, I don't really get the connection. I thought James is suddenly changing the topic again from talking about temptation to talking about the goodness of God. But he isn't. James is giving us the antidote to temptation. And here it is. The antidote to temptation is the goodness of God. How can we say no to sin? How do we deal with temptation? If we think sin is simply about breaking the rules, that's easy. The answer is just say no to sin. Just don't do it. Simple and easy. But the Bible does not give us that answer. Do you know why? Because the Bible tells us that sin is first and foremost the problem of the heart before it's a problem of behavior. It is not so much simply a problem of doing, it's a problem of desiring. That's why if you try to deal with sin and simply, I need to say no to sin, that doesn't work. Do you know why you sin? See, you sin because you believe doing so will make you happy. Every time you sin, you believe the lie of the devil. Like, you know what? God actually is stingy. God is actually trying to withhold something good from you. God does not want you to be happy. Isn't that how the devil tricked Adam and Eve in the garden? What did the devil say? Did God really say this? I mean, come on. If God loves you, why would he withhold this fruit from you? He cannot love you. That's why you need to pursue your own happiness. And ever since Adam and Eve, the devil still used the same trick to us. We believe that God is withholding something good from us. God is stingy. And therefore, it is up to us to pursue our own good. And James tells us, do not be deceived by the enemy. Do not be deceived. See, that's why I love what Thomas Chalmers wrote in his famous sermon 
the expulsive power of new affection. This is what he wrote, okay? And this is mind-breaking, okay? This is literally what I try to do every single Sunday. He put it in one sentence, okay? He's way smarter than me. Good thing he lived many hundred years ago. This is what he said. The only way to break the hold of a beautiful object on the soul is to show it an object even more beautiful. Do you see what he's saying? The only way for you to be able to say no to sin is not enough for you to say, okay, I can't do it, but what you need to do, your heart needs to be captivated by something even more beautiful, which tells us the antidote to temptation is not just to say no, but to fall in love. How do we do that? Can James tell us two things that we must do? First, remember that God is the giver of every good gift in our life. This sounds simple, but this is crucial. Why? Because in every trial and temptation, you and I want to question God's goodness. Isn't that true? See, every time we face trial, our heart is asking this question, well, if God is good, if God is kind, if God is loving, then why does he allow me to experience this hardship? Isn't that true? And that is exactly what the enemy wants us to believe. The enemy wants us to believe that God does not care about us. He does not have our best interest at heart. God is keeping the good stuff from us. But James now reminds us, no, 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 church. Every good gift in your life comes from God. God gives nothing bad to his children. Everything he gives is good, and whatever is good, he will not withhold from his children. So instead of tempting us with evil, God only gives good gifts to us. And here's the thing about God's good gift. They're not the sun. They're the moon. Do you know what I mean by that? See, the moon is always shifting. I know if you come to someone's wedding a couple of weeks ago, he talks highly about the moon. But the moon is always shifting. The moon is always changing its lights because it has no light in itself. It just reflects the light of the sun, right? But the sun never changes. The sun is always shining. We can hide from the sun. We can get away from the sun, but the sun is always the same. And here's what, what James' point is about God and His good gift. The good gift that God's given us, they're good, but they ain't the point. They had the moon. They won't be able to satisfy us. I mean, they might satisfy us this week, but they will not satisfy us next week. But let me tell you what is different. God is different because God is the sun. He is the Father of light with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In other words, James said, when we receive good gift from God, whatever it is, we must see the light behind that gift, the perfect light, the unchanging light. Who is that? God. God is changeless in His giving. He's always giving. He's always willing. And He's always available. And the intensity of God's goodness never changes. God does good all the time because He is good all the time. Evil cannot come from God because God is infinite goodness. See, God is like a shadow whose goodness lengthens or shortens and, oh, sorry, God is not like a shadow whose goodness lengthens or shortens depending on what time of day it is. God's goodness is unchanging. Listen, God never gets in a bad mood. I mean, God never changes for the worse. Imagine if he does. Imagine if one day God woke up and he feel bad. I don't feel good today, so I'm going to withhold sustaining the universe for an hour. The next thing we know, the sun falls on the earth, and we have a free 1,000 degree sauna. Chaotic. Aren't you thankful that God never gets in a good mood? I mean, a bad mood? That's a good news. But let me tell you what's better. God never changed for the better. You know why that's amazing? Because if God can change for the better, it means 
there was something deficient in God in the first place. But there's nothing deficient in God. He's infinitely good, and He is always good. And one of the best ways to deal with temptation is to rejoice in the goodness of God in our life. Whatever good we experience today in our life, it comes from God. So rather than focusing on what we don't have because of our trial, focus on the good gift God has given us. See, if you're healthy today, let me tell you why you're healthy, because God is sustaining your health. If you're alive today, let me tell you why you're alive, because God is giving you oxygen to breathe. If tonight, after church, you can enjoy good meal, KFC or steak, whatever it is, that's because God is giving us the tongue to be able to taste different flavors. If you're going to go on holiday to Europe, to Vietnam, wherever it is, and enjoy that beautiful sight, that's because God is creating those places to invoke our awe of Him. If you have friends, spouses, children, that's because God giving them to you for you to enjoy their company. There's nothing good in our life that does not come from God. So the first thing that we need to understand is we need to enjoy the good gift of God. But do not mistake the moon for the sun. Those good gifts are given to point us to the giver. That's the first one. But the second antidote to fight temptation is this. Remember our new birth. Because our new birth is the greatest proof of God's goodness to us. I mean, it's the best gift God could ever give us. Okay? And let me be extremely clear. If today you call yourself Christian and you have not experienced a new birth, you are not Christian. It doesn't matter what your license says. It doesn't matter if you've been church all your life. If you have not experienced a new birth, you are not a Christian. But here's the thing about a new birth. It is out of our control. I mean, we don't get to decide whether we want to experience a new birth or not. It doesn't matter how many PhD we have. It doesn't matter where we get our MBA. We can't will ourselves into a new birth. James say it is God's work and decision alone. We are brought forth out of God's own will. So let me put it this way. It's like a natural birth. Okay? I, I was born on January 4th in the year not too long ago. Okay, I was born in uh, Denpasar, Bali, Indonesia. Okay, and my dad's name is Samuel. My mom's name is Lydia. I can tell you the basic facts about my birth, but I have nothing to do with them. I did not choose or decide to be born on 4th January in Denpasar. Nor did I choose to be my, the son of my parents, right? I did not choose to be Asian with these squinty eyes. I was born this way because of the work of my parents. Well, you know, they did what husband and wife would do when they have nothing to do at night, and voila, nine months later, here I am. I contributed nothing to my natural birth. And in the same way, we contributed nothing to our new birth. It is God's work and God's will alone. God is the one who caused us to experience New birth, and we need to get this right because many Christians get this wrong. We do not experience new birth because we become Christian. We became Christian because God has caused us to experience a new birth. It's like having a birth certificate, right? Which one comes first? Your birth or your birth certificate? Well, your birth certificate does not cause you to be born, but it shows you that you were born. We became Christian because God has caused us to experience new birth. It's the work of God. And you know how God did it? Here's what James said, through the word of truth. What that is. What is that? The gospel. Yes, it is God who caused us to experience new birth. But the way God does it is through the means of hearing the gospel. If you can look back how you became Christian, let me tell you, this is what happened. Somehow, You heard the gospel being proclaimed, and you don't understand what happened to you, but suddenly you believe. Faith arose, 
and you're amazed by the gospel. I mean, and then you were transformed by the gospel. I mean, you don't understand what happened, but one moment you think the cross of Christ was extremely dumb, idiotic, the next moment you can't stop talking about it. You just fall in love with it. And you're just like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. And James said, listen, that has nothing to do with you. That happens solely because God chose to do so. You experience you, but not because you're smarter, not because you're better. You became Christian because God willed it to do so. Just like we don't contribute anything to our natural birth, we contribute nothing to our spiritual birth. It is God's work from beginning to the end. He is the giver of all the good gifts in our life. And there is no better gift than the gift of new birth. Now, I know some of you, some of you might say, well, here's the thing about the, me, Pastor Yos. I was the one who made the decision to believe. I made that decision to walk down the aisle and say, I believe, I surrender my life to God. And yes, you did, my friend. I did not deny that. Yes, you did. But that decision, the only reason you can make that decision is because God's supernatural work made you make that decision. The reason you chose God, because God has chosen you. And it gets even better, okay? And, and then James says this at the last part of the first. He says that we should be a kind of first fruit of his, crea- of his creatures. Now, for us who do not live in an agriculture society, first fruit does not mean anything to us. But for those who live in an agrarian culture, first fruit means it is a foretaste of what is to come. So when we see a first fruit, we know harvest is coming. And what James is saying is here is beautiful. James says this, listen, you know the wonderful thing that God has done in your life? You know how God made you a new creation? You know how God saved you? All those good things is just a foretaste of what is to come. Because there is coming a day when God is going to redeem all creation and all things will be made new. The old will be gone and the new will come. There will be no more trial. There will be no more temptation. And what God has done in our life right now, all the goodness that we experience is just a foretaste of the infinite goodness that is to come. That's how good God is. And when we see God's infinite, unchanging goodness toward us, that's what breaks the power of temptation. Because now our heart is so captivated by His goodness that we do not desire anything else more than Him. But it's a problem. And let me close with this. Do you know why a lot of time we don't feel this? I believe one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, why we are not captivated by what God has done for us is this. Because we think we deserve it. I mean, it's really hard, really, really hard for us to comprehend that we do not deserve anything good from God. Or we did deserve something, we did. But what we deserve is not good gift. What we deserve from God is condemnation and eternal judgment. Because the Bible is clear that we were born as enemies of God. And what we deserve for rebelling against the Almighty King is hell. What we deserve for rebelling against God, the universe, was eternal condemnation. But rather than giving us what we deserve, he gave us every good and perfect gift. He caused us to be born again. He turned the enemies of God into lovers of God. He forgave our rebellion. He forgave our sin and He made us a new creation. And not only that, then, but now He made us beautiful in His, in his sight in all our weaknesses right now. Because of Jesus, we are found blameless, holy, and righteous. Do you know what it cost God to do so? Because it came free for us. Yes, the good gift came freely to us, but it cost God everything. 
in order to save us, Jesus was condemned. In order to adopt us, Jesus was abandoned. In order to give us every good gift, Jesus had to receive every evil we should have received. Jesus was stripped naked and crucified on the cross to make us beautiful in God's sight. So the price Jesus had to pay to give us God's good and perfect gift was none other than His very own life. That's how much God loves us. Let me close with this. So, if we see the extent to which God is willing to go to love us, do we have any reason to doubt His goodness toward us right now? Because when we see what Jesus has done for us at the cross, here's what happened. He becomes the one that our heart desired the most. And this is the antidote to temptation. Every time trials come, we are tempted to doubt the goodness of God. And the, temp- the antidote to that is look to the cross of Jesus Christ. Gaze at the wonder of the cross and be captivated by it. Because the only way to break the grip of sin on our heart is we need to love someone better. We need a far more beautiful object. And there he is, Jesus Christ, loving us to the cross. So why do you think that in every sermon, we always, I always bring you to Jesus? Is that just because it's a cool thing to do? No. Every sermon, I always say, look to Jesus, look to Jesus, look to Jesus. Why? Because simply saying no to sin does not work. Because we need to fall in love. That's how you break the grip of temptation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we first of all, we acknowledge our weaknesses. We acknowledge our inability, Lord, to make us right on our own. We can't do it. We are filled with flaw. And if we, if we want to be honest with you, Lord, it's so easy for us to not see trials as a blessing, but rather see trials as a reason for us to give in to temptation. And Father, I pray that as we listen to the sermon, as we we are reminded of your good gift for our life, pray that you give us the antidote to fight against the temptation to sin. And Lord, I can only speak. I can't even make this happen in my own life, Lord. But Holy Spirit, you can you are the only one who can make Jesus shine bright in our hearts. So my prayer is to that in our midst. For every one of us right now who are struggling with sin, who are struggling with temptation, I don't know what kind of temptation it is, but I pray, Holy Spirit, that you make Jesus shine bright in our heart. Make Jesus so beautiful. Make Jesus so great to the point that we can, sim- we can say that Jesus is far more beautiful than my desire to sin. Jesus is far more beautiful than my desire for approval. Jesus is far more dis- beautiful than my desire for comfort, whatever it is. Holy Spirit, make the gospel come alive. We can't do this by our own strength. We need you. To do that supernatural work in our heart. Help us gaze the beauty of the gospel, to be captivated by it, and break free from the power of temptation. And we ask this in your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray.